So our next speaker is not an Andrew, he's a Matthew Smith, uh, and he's not a psychiatrist or psychologist, he's a historian at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, he is, you will not be surprised to hear, interested in the history of mental illness and its management, and in particular the social history. Uh, and he is also the lead researcher in a fascinating project called the Pinky Resilience Project, which I'm hoping he's going to tell us a little bit about as well. So, Matthew, take it away. Okay, well, uh, and now for something completely different, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so, um, yeah, so I'm a historian. Uh, I do have a background as a youth counselor back home in Canada, so I come to my historical interests through uh, working with young people struggling with various difficulties and, and really trying to unpack why we think what we think about them and their problems. So I first came into uh, the field of the history of mental health through uh, trying to understand more about the history of hyperactivity or what we might call ADHD today. Um, I used to work at, a, at an office uh, run by the YMCA of Edmonton, Alberta, and whenever we had a young kid in who seemed to have a problem, they left our doors with a handy-dandy ADHD diagnosis and a prescription. And I, got, I found after a while that this was just a strange way of dealing with these kids because they came from difficult backgrounds, some of them had been abused, some of them had been involved in gangs, had been in jail, came from broken homes, etc., 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 and it seemed as though we weren't really interested in those things, we just wanted to make sure that they left with a diagnosis and a prescription. And so the more I looked at the history of ADHD, the more I realized that this is something that, um, that came at a certain time, it came at a certain place, and uh, the reasons why we think about children in that way don't necessarily have a lot to do with children and what they need, but have an awful lot to do with what adults want and need of children. And so that's, that's how I got into this area. Um, so I've done some research on the history of ADHD, looking at various theories that help to explain uh, the disorder and why it emerged. But I'm also, and that, that interest has kind of provided me a bit of a springboard to look at mental health more generally and looking at changes in how uh, we, we've understand, uh, we've understood mental health and illness over past centuries. So one thing that occurred to me recently, and this, this gets us to the pinky stuff, is that um, for most of human history, we've gone to great lengths to prevent mental illness. Now think about that, preventing mental illness, not treating it, not diagnosing it and treating it, preventing it. Um, for the last 50 or so years, prevention has sort of fallen off the radar to a certain degree, certainly with respect to how much money is spent in terms of dealing with psychiatric issues. And so what I wanted to do, look into is, well, what lessons can we learn from the past that will help us prevent mental health problems from occurring in the future. And so, uh, a few years ago, uh, through uh, a psychiatrist who was working at Pinky St. Peter's School in Musselburgh, Ian McClure, uh, I got to know Sarah, who, Sarah Ogden, the head teacher at the school. Wave your hand, Sarah, I'll embarrass you. Well, that's not very high. Um, so Sarah's here. And Ian and Sarah saw what was going on at the school. One of the things that they saw is that as children went through the school, there was an increase in the number of referrals to child and adolescent mental health services. And they kind of thought, well, what's going on with this? You know, is there any way that we can maybe point this graph in another direction? And so, what we did through the help of the Scottish University's Insight Initiative, and Stella was involved with this as well, along with uh, uh, quite a few other people, is that we underwent a series of, I guess, explorations into what different factors are important in terms of determining whether a child is resilient 
if you want to use that terminology, and whether and what factors help them avoid uh, falling into the trap of mental illness. And so through a process of a lot of talking and meeting with people and having various events, the school de developed a, n a number I mean, we kind of wanted, we, we thought they'd maybe come up with one or two initiatives. I think they ended up coming up with at least half a dozen. Um, and it, and uh, any of you that have kids in school like I do know that um, sometimes schools are hard to change. It takes a while for schools to do something different. And it often takes a head teacher like Sarah to really grab the bull by the horns and, and uh, make a big change. But that's what the school did. So uh, I'm not going to list all the interventions that... Um, that the school started, but I think a couple are really important. Some of the things that we acknowledged as being really important and po possibly equally important, some things that s the school could actually do without extra money and on a sustainable basis, um, we're looking at relationships. Now the, the buzzword for this today is attachment and the buzzword for this 75 years ago was attachment. Um, so you can call it attachment or you can call it relationships. But the important thing is that the kids in the school had adults in their lives, hopefully their parents, but also people at the school that they could talk to, they, could, they felt comfortable dealing with, and that they had a connection with. And so there was a number of initiatives uh, started in the school to do that. One that emerged, which is a very simple idea, is, is called the nurture room. So no child, no matter how naughty they've been, uh, leaves the school. If they're having problems, they can't be in the school or in the class environment, they go into a nurture room. And in the nurture room, which is a, a lovely environment, they have staff, and I've just been told tonight that there's gonna be two staff in the nurture room in future, not just one, which is brilliant. That staff provides that attachment for that student and they provide educational opportunities, but more importantly, it allows that student to stay part of the school, stay part of that, that family atmosphere. And that, that goes a really long way in making sure that they stay on board. Another thing that, uh, that emerged that I thought was really useful uh, and, and fascinating was uh, Pinky Podcasts. So what, one of the things that we realized is that, is that there was a bit of a gulf between the school and the surrounding environment and also that a lot of these kids didn't necessarily have the confidence to communicate effectively with others. And so because we, we had a, a, there was a friend of the school who, who had a background in radio production, we were able to train, or he was able to train these students up to do proper interviews and to uh, compile podcasts that you can Google and, and listen to. And so in May of last year, uh, I brought, to, or Sarah brought the students to Strathclyde University and they interviewed our principal, Sir Jim McDonald. Um, they interviewed the dean of our faculty. They interviewed all sorts of people, just going up in, in the cafeteria, walking up to people. These are 12, you know, 11 and 12 year old kids. How many, how many of you at 11 or 12 would have been comfortable going up to someone in a cafeteria, in Ikea, for example, and ask them questions about, you know, what do you do here? You know, how did you get here, et cetera, et cetera. These kids were able to do that. And I think that's building up that kind of confidence is really quite remarkable and that, that will help them on as they go into secondary as well. So a number of other uh, initiatives at the school uh, have, been, have been put forth and I think more are coming uh, as well. But I think the important point is that what the school has done is basically said there are, there are things we can do to prevent mental health problems from happening and there are ways that we can help our kids that aren't overly onerous they're not going to. They're sustainable, and perhaps they make the job uh, of being a teacher a lot more enjoyable as well. And so, what we're going to try to do in future is figure out what you know enable other schools, hopefully, to take on board some of these ideas and, and do some of this stuff as well. Sounds like an amazing project. Is do you see yourself as giving the kids some kind of skills? Um, some ways of handling stress or uh, developing relationships? I think th there is quite a lot of skill building uh, involved and, and, and that's important. I think that's partly what, what goes on with the Pinky Podcast is that they get to see... Part of the problem 
is that, and again, this goes back a bit to my back background as a youth counselor, is that a lot of young people have no clue about what's coming to them. You know, they don't know what to do. They have a vague idea of what a few jobs might be out there, but they don't have that sense of hope, and I could do this, I could do that. And so the podcast, for example, allow them to talk to people in the community who have, who have done that, who have found things to do. Um, there's one really fascinating one with, what was his name, Tom, Tim, Tom Kitchen? Who's a cook. If your last name is Kitchen, <laughs> good job for you. But it was fascinating, because you could tell this fellow, you know, came from a relatively similar background, and but he just found what he was passionate about, and he was able to enthuse these kids about it. So I think that's part of it, but it's also, again, how, uh, enabling them to have those relationships in the school that so that the school is a, is a very positive influence in their life. It's not something they dread. The, these kids are not going to leave Pinky thinking, oh, geez, I'm so glad I'm out of here. They're going to think, you know, this was a special time in my life. And I think that's, that's quite important, uh, not just for the school and, and its broader purpose, but also as a building block for these kids later on in life. Uh, I guess the critical question is, um, do you have much in the way of evidence that, you know, resilience is being increased or mental illness is being prevented? Um, well, that's an interesting question for me uh, as a historian because one of the things I love going doing is going back, reading over uh, scientific studies and poking holes in them and see, <laughs> saying all oh, the evidence actually isn't all that important sometimes. Uh, but, but they are doing things. They're actually, they're actually measuring quite a lot in the school in terms of academic performance. And uh, we're going to have a, the psychiatrist is going to be able to come in and do some biological uh, market, marker or test for biological markers of stress and that sort of thing. And I think that's good, but I think generally the people in the school know that it's making a difference, and that's what really matters. You know, Sarah knows it's making a difference. Yes, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah has to come in here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have about 70 children who go in and out of the nurturing, so nobody's in there full time, but every single child. Um, they are. Um, they have a Vauxhall scale, uh, and they're measured every term. So we know what we're working on um, with those children. We have social groups that are happening every afternoon with different children, and they also have Vauxhall. So we're measuring them, um, and we're seeing what we need to work with the different children on. And yes, we are seeing um, increases in. Um, the social and emotional um, development of children. So it's not um, just that we know. We know, but we actually have the evidence there as well. So, um, and I think what Matt's saying is, it's very, very, it's holistic. It's everything. It's the ethos that you want to create surrounding a child, surrounding anybody who is not in a good place. You know, the first and foremost is, we don't shout at children because that doesn't make you feel good. So we're trying to develop relationships, children with children, you know, staff with children, the staff in the school with the families, all the other professionals that surround children as well, so that actually these people are going to go out into the world able to do, able to achieve their potential because they've got this really solid base to go with. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. It isn't just to prevent them going off and having to be referred to CARMS. It's to create an all-round person that is good and can, like um, Andrew said, to bounce back. So that's what, you know, that's what we're doing. And at the moment we have 19 different things going on that we're measuring. So, you know, it just grows and grows and everybody takes ownership. Very interesting, thank you. So I think the last question about this particular section that I want to ask anyway is, so is it just in this one school? Is it being rolled out to other schools across Lothian, Scotland, the rest of the world, or not? 
I should have kept the mic back with Sarah. Um, well, we'd love we'd love it to to expand to other schools, and if there's anyone here who has kids in other schools or who are teachers, then uh, let's chat about that. I think, and that and that's where the evidence issue comes in because government likes to. And if they want to fund something, or they're going to fund something, they want to see that there's some proof to to demonstrate that it's efficacious. So um, I think you know we're in the process of we've only been doing it for a, a little over a year, really. Um, although there were things going on before that as well. Um, so yes, we would like to to roll it out more 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 so. I think the other thing though that that's come out with the school is that. The solution, just like for an individual, the solution for different schools are going to be different. So um, what's worked at Pinky might not necessarily work at another school. Um, but it's a process that the school needs to go through to figure out what's going to work for them. Okay. Well, thanks, Matt. And uh, we'll get you back later. We'll get about 15 minutes or so for the remaining table discussion, I think.